All right, welcome to lesson uh, number 13 <laughs> in our Lunch and Learn series. Uh, first, I want to uh, call out my sponsor, the IIBA, International Institute of Business Analysis of Tampa Bay, for hosting these uh, Lunch and Learns. And this particular one is on data transformation, in particular ETL, extract, transform, and load, and data behavior. For those of you that are new to this, or to these Lunch and Learns, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Richard Frederick, and I teach courses basically to two audiences, business analysts, product owners, um, that's one audience, and then uh, project manager, scrum master, roles in the other audience and you could be all four of those things as one person the uh slide that you're looking at right now is kind of the cover slide to the requirements development course i basically have two specialty courses for business data analytics the language of data one is a requirements class and one is a project management class and I joke with people that if you're struggling with requirements you're not alone because all of these logos represent standards groups that are all trying to wrap their arms around how we do requirements effectively and of course you know you've got to get the requirements right first before the project operates successfully so everything i teach is based on these standards it's all open source uh, there's you know no secrets here uh, but and feel free at the end to share this information with anybody that you wish All right, this is the uh, agenda for the requirements class. It's basically a traditional requirements class in that it covers what I call the four fingers of requirements, elicit, analyze, document, and validate. However, what makes it different is that it focuses predominantly on data as opposed to um, product and process oriented requirements. The reason I do that is simply that the standard curriculum, which I've been teaching for 15 years, focuses predominantly on product and process. No big deal. And we're always going to have product and process as a part of what we do as analysts and project managers. However, now more than ever, we're having to add a third concept, which is data, to our traditional way that we approach what we do. So that's the requirements agenda. This is the project management agenda. You'll notice that there's some colors on this slide. Uh, those kind of represent the roles. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those roles. You've seen the picture in the top. I'll go through those here in a moment. Uh, but the business analyst, product owner is purple. The project manager, scrum master is yellow. The IT system architect is green. The developer, subject matter expert, data scientist is also green. The uh, QA test is um, blue, and then kind of the orangey red color it represents intelligent assistance. A little bit about me uh, I built a software company, I owned a software company in the 1990s that built software robots. We integrated software into solutions that ran autonomously, that meant there was no humans involved. That's why they're called robots. Um, and we did that pretty effectively for a long time and i thought that when i got into training 15 years ago that everybody would already be using robots uh, so i was off by about 15 years it's just now starting to show up and there's reasons for that mainly it has to do with data storage but we won't go there today <laughs> the the goal of these lunch and learns is always to seek to understand and I will tell anybody that's interested, I think that the greatest skill of a business analyst and, and not necessarily a project manager or scrum master, not that this is not a useful skill, but of a business analyst product owner is to be curious. And so we're always trying to tell people to seek to understand, just to remind you to be curious. This particular section we're going to talk about uh, ETL, extract, transform, and load, and I'm also going to get in and explain a little bit about data behavior, um, ERD, entity relationship diagramming, joint denormalization, star schema, dimensional OLAP, and dashboard and intelligence. 
you'll notice to the right, if you've never seen this slide before, or this, these lunch and learns, is there's uh, some photographs. So let me work from the top and, and go down to the bottom. Uh, the individual at the top represents my business analyst product owner. Uh, right underneath that is uh, my project manager scrum master. Uh, underneath that is my IT system architect. Underneath that is my developer, data scientist, subject matter expert. Underneath that is my QA test. And then at the bottom, you'll see a blue entity, which represents intelligent assistance. Not artificial intelligence. We're, we're quite a ways away from that, but just intelligent assistance, which will be a part of your team of the future. So this, this group on the right represents what I call the team of the future, which is happening very, very quickly. Uh, for some of you, it may be happening right now. And so this, these courses are specific to understanding the digital transformation, which is really about data. I mean, when people say digital transformation, what they're really talking about is putting data everywhere. And of course, with the rollout of 5G, we're going to have just massive amounts of data that are going to be coming at us. So again, if you're here in these classes um, and, you're, and you're coming to these on a weekly basis, uh, you're giving yourself a head start towards what is about to change dramatically. So this first thing we wanted to kind of do is uh, touch on, so again, for those of you that are new, uh, we've covered a lot of topics. I mean, this is number 13 in the series. And in this particular topic, I wanted to touch on kind of what happens with data. I mean, we get it in and, and you'll see that you can see my role, my players. Um, so my business analyst product owner is kind of above where it says business apps and custom apps and sensors and devices. So they're, they're kind of at the initial stage they're both at the beginning and the end and and really if if i drew it properly they'd be through the whole thing but just creating role delineation for the sake of education here but once it gets past the ba product owner it's going to move into um, more of the data source data staging data warehouse data provisioning your bi applications your testing and your uh, output of automated systems. And you'll see that there's a big green, kind of a big green, I, I call that kind of a square to oval in the middle. And that's really sort of what we're gonna focus on today. Uh, and that's really the, the role of the IT system architect, which <laughs> we jokingly call the data wrangler. <laughs> that's the person whose job it is to kind of wrap their arms around this whole process. And if you ever do work on data projects, you'll know that their job is probably the bulk of what we have to do. So, so anybody that's working on data projects, if you have a data wrangler, go take them out to lunch because they're putting a lot of effort in to make sure that everything is done properly for everybody else in the process. So that's a call out to you, Cliff. <laughs> this is, Cliff said, this is my, my specialty. So anyway, Taking those symbols, and let me, again, let me just, I apologize, I, I went hit on that really quickly. Your data source, your ERP, your CRM, uh, your we're gonna have data coming from everywhere, right? Your, your on-premise data, which could be your point of sale, it could be your enterprise resource planning system, it could be local Excel files and access files that are departmental or individualistic. All of those can provide information into um, the machine, what I call the machine. We also have uh, third party data that we get through our um, software as a service, uh, things like Salesforce or Microsoft CRM or whoever else that use HubSpot or whatever tools that you use externally to your business. We might have external enrichment in the form of Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, we might also have direct customer and or partner data that we use. And all of this data has to be brought in and massaged and manipulated so that it can be utilized for decision making. So at the end of the day, really everything that we do is about enabling our executives to be able to make decisions. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. When I joke with people in IT, I'm like, we all exist to help enable decision making of our executives. I mean, that's really why we're here. So under the process of 
you know, what I call IT system architecture, you'll see it says data staging and integration, data warehouse, data provisioning. And then on these columns, it says extract, transform, and load. And you'll see it says data, metadata services. And I'm gonna talk about those here in a moment, in a little bit more detail. Then you've got your um, BI applications. You'll see that I have the data scientist developer and my QA kind of out around the outside of that. And then at the bottom, I've got my intelligence where it says predictive analytics and data mining. And this is where we're going. I mean, many ins institutions are already moved, have already moved into this direction. Uh, the big challenge that they're having is their data. So this big green circle in the middle, that's, that's the challenge, is getting all of it, all of the data set up properly to then do the outputs effectively and the fact now that we're just dealing with so much data and it's coming at such a high rate just makes all this that much more challenging. Okay, so extract, transform, and load is really about, again, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. These five candid, uh, categories, and you'll see there's obviously it starts at number two. The first one is uh, business understanding, which is not a part of this slide. It was in a previous class or previous session. Is part of what's known as the CRISP cross industry standard process for data mining and machine learning, CRISP DMML, which we talked about at the very beginning. Gosh, it's been months now <laughs> we've been doing this back in the very beginning. And so this particular one is uh, data understanding, data prep, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. If you look at the uh, project management agenda that I showed you earlier, you'll see where they're, they're all color coded. So everything's connected. And so all of this information falls under that agenda. But under data understanding, the probably the most important bullet is the very first one, which is a master data dictionary. And I find it really interesting that uh, the scrum master project manager of the future also needs to have very strong DBA skills. And I'm probably one of the few people that will walk around and say that um, in my company, my software company, that's exactly what that person did uh, because the resources were no longer just humans. And this is something that, you know, we don't really spend a lot of time talking about because most people don't want to think in terms of having a robot as a team member, but that's where it's going. So it's really important that your scrum master project manager understand not only how to schedule <clears throat> human resources, but also how to schedule intelligent assistant resources. And all of that begins with a centralized master data dictionary. And then uh, all of the data that gets accumulated uh, is brought into online transactional processing systems, OLTP. And there's all kinds of different ways that it comes in and stored, blob storage, SQL database, SQL data warehouses, Azure cloud tables, desktop uploads, Hadoop hive queries, manual data entry, data feeds, on-premise SQL servers, web URLs. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that the data comes in. So it's really critical that this individual have a full understanding of that. And I would say both your product owner, business analyst, and Scrum Master project manager both need to have a very strong understanding of, of the data. <clears throat> data prep, uh, again, is really what this section is about, um, is getting the data ready for analysis. So uh, extract, load, extract, transform, and load, uh, the metadata services, master data management, which is also known as MDM. On the previous slide, it's called MDM. And that's kind of your governance overseeing all of the data that's happening. And then ODS is an operational data store, like a giant caching system that you know commonly used data is brought in much at a much faster rate um, your data warehouse which is kind of like institutional memory it's just hey we're you know remembering all the things that we've done historically then that data can be parsed out into what we call departmental data marts um, and then kind of at a more mechanical level uh, we take that data and we turn it into a star schema we have to design semantic layering for uh, all of the end tools. And then that enables what's called OLAP, Online Analytical Processing, which we're gonna do a whole um, 
presentation about uh, OLTP and o OLAP at, a, at another session and then providing SQL views. For what purpose? Well, really for modeling. And uh, again, later on, we're gonna do a thing what I call machine learning EZ, and I'm gonna go into this in more detail, but just, you know, you look at machine learning and it kind of falls into just very simply two categories, two simple categories, unsupervised learning, uh, which is, you know, your clustering, your dimensionality reduction, association analysis, hidden Markov, and your supervised learning, which is regression, decision trees, random forest, and classification. Probably the easiest way to think of modeling if you're not doing this all the time is clustering and classification. That's, that's kind of the easiest way to think of it. You're, you're trying to group things together in order to classify them. And then the tools of your data scientists or whoever is working on this is scatter plots, bar charts, histograms, uh, R and Python are tools for, you know, building a lot of this information together, uh, confusion matrix, decision trees, things of that nature. Eventually, it works its way over to evaluation, uh, which is, you know, looking at is the data noisy, is it corrupted, is it dirty, is it inaccurate, are there misplaced data values, are there inexact values, is there insufficient data size, poor representation of data samples, redundant data, ultimately to do what? Deploy. And deploy in what format? Well, basically forecasting. So much of why we're doing this and the main reason why we're doing this is for forecasting purposes, trying to predict the future based on the past. I'll show you an example of that here in a moment. That allows us to then potentially optimize. And this covers all kinds of business scenarios. I mean, it, it can cover forecasting covers, you know, pretty much every part of how your machine or institution operates. By the way, I call your institution a machine. And again, if you've been in the previous, some of the previous sessions, I explain why it's a machine and why you want to look at it as a machine. It will enable you to begin to better elicit, analyze, document, and validate measurable requirements. But some of the main scenarios that I'm going to be addressing, uh, mainly our project portfolio, and in more particular um, instance, demand management, which is the recognition that there's more work than there's people to get the job done. <laughs> So, which then leads you to uh, recommendations. You know, wh where should we go? If we, if we have too many projects and not enough people, what's the best thing we should focus on first? All right, so that's, that's ETL. I mean, that's kind of in a, in a very high level, very short two slide approach to, you know, what is it that we're, we're trying to do? Well, we're trying to take this data that comes in in all these different formats and turn it into something that we can analyze and then make decisions against. Okay. Which is great. But now what does it really look like? What, what's kind of that look like? So we're going to call that, that's data behavior. All right. And I'm, I've got this slide in here twice because I'm going to show it to you and then I'm going to go through it individually. And then I'm going to show it to you again. And hopefully it'll, it'll make more sense. So Data behavior. So when I when I started working uh, and trying to train a lot of this information, first of all, no nobody that I had ever, none of the material that I had used had actually connected all these dots. And as an instructor, it used to drive me a little bit crazy because we would teach something and then that was it. We did, we never really took it any further. And and the thing that we would teach and what's traditional in the business analysis curriculum. I mean, it doesn't even exist in project management curriculum, but in the business analysis curriculum, the only thing we really teach about data is the ERD, the entity relationship diagram. And if you've ever taken a BA class, you probably have maybe had to go through and build a, a, a very simple um, entity relationship diagram. We're connecting all the nouns and their attributes together, entities or objects which really are individually, those individual boxes really are tables. And so you'll see the column that says ERD, entity relationship. Those are data structures, uh, also known as instances. That's our transactional data. And from a SQL perspective, um, the, the, com the commands that are usually associated with that would be like create table, insert into, update, delete, commit, rollback. We teach you ERD, we don't ever teach you anything about SQL, which is how the vast majority of people take the design and actually put it to work. <laughs> so that's why I put it in there. 
But that data alone doesn't really allow us to do analysis. We have to take that data, which is quote normalized, and we have to denormalize it by joining it together. Okay, and I'm going to cover this in more detail. So I'll just I'll just go through this really quickly. So we go from ERD to join denormalization to star schema to dimensional OLAP to dashboard and intelligence. Okay, so let me let me go through it like this. Okay, so we just did this and. The thing that I really want you to take away is the two diagrams. Um, each one of those rectangles, in a way, is, is really a, a table of information. So these are all different tables that are connected to each other. So if you're not familiar with this, and you, maybe you've seen an ERD diagram, but no one ever told you, oh yeah, each one of those represents like its own little database table. And they've got terms, schema represents you know, all your field names, uh, obviously, a horizontal row is a record. Um, a vertical column is a field, uh, you know, and then multiple versions of those are called tables. Great. Those are also known as instances. And so, again, that's kind of a buzzword that when you're when you're talking to people, people usually in the business they use the word instance a lot. So if you don't know what that means, now you know it just means tables of data. <laughs> And generally speaking, this is transactional data. This is the data that comes in off of our forms. When someone fills out a form on your website, it's gonna go into a transactional database. Like when they fill out their customer address, that's gonna go into some form, some transactional data table, great. But that information in and of itself is not enough to do full analysis if we wanna connect it to some other kind of information, all right? So first thing that we have to do then is we have to modify and change that data around. We've got to take it from this denormalized uh, version, which if you see, if you look on the diagram, you'll see at the top, uh, there's, you know, the what looks like the ERD, the different entities. And then at the bottom, there's just one long horizontal row and, and they've kind of connected everything together. That's, that's called denormalization. And that's done through the process of joining. It's called a join command. So when you're in SQL, if you're, if you're learning SQL, which I highly recommend that you do, if you're gonna learn to do business data analytics, you gotta have some basic knowledge of SQL. So generally it's a select from command. And then what you're doing is, is there are these join commands. There's inner joins and left joins and right joins and full outer joins and cross joins. And we, we, we're not gonna get into that today. Just look at the pictures underneath. It shows how the data is overlapped. And again, on another session, I will get into more detail and I'll actually teach you more about how that all works. But I just wanted you to get the idea of, okay, we're taking transactional data and we're mapping it together, all right, into what's known as a star schema. So star schema is its own unique data structure or instance where we are taking transactional data and we're converting it into analytical data. And the data is being joined together in what's known as a fact table. And it's that fact table that we run reports against. So, and, and the, the commands that, that work with that from SQL are, you know, select from where. So select from is you're pulling your data and then where is you're pulling it from where. Um, and then having um, maybe some specific filter that you're looking for, or you're grouping by a certain filter, or you're ordering by a filter. All of that helps us to then kind of narrow down what we're going to be presenting, uh, either electronically, automatically, or manually to senior management for them to analyze in the form of reports or dashboards. That process of connecting all that data together is called dimensional OLAP, dimensional online analytical processing. And what that does is it aggregates and summarizes all of our data. And this, this now we've taken transactional data, we've turned it into analytical data so that we can measure it in the form of what are known as pivot tables or measurements. Pivot tables are measurements. I'm always fascinated by that. And so you have um, functions, count functions, sum function, average, min, max. Those are pivot tables. Those are measurements. And 
why are we doing this? Well, if you look kind of above the diagrams, it says historical status question. I want you to think in terms of historical status, which is how do we get here? <laughs> and future forecast, which is based on how we got here, where are we going? So the example, it says, you know, how much chocolate did we sell in the Southeast in May of, you know, 20XX, whatever the year might be. And again, the idea is that we can take all of our transactional data and we can query it through a series of questions. Now, this is really important to, especially to the business analyst product owner of the future, because the understanding business side of the CRISP DMML requires that the analyst be knowledgeable about what are the best kinds of questions to ask, or at least be the person who communicates with senior management about their questions, and then is the person that sort of guides that process, those questions all the way through the process, so that those questions can be answered correctly. Okay, that's kind of where a lot of this is going. But then what happens is once the OLAP cubes are set up, then we can start running dashboards. And these dashboards uh, enable us, well, first of all, historically to look backwards. Uh, and, they, and they provide a level of data visualization. But, well, and they can also, excuse me, provide descriptive dashboard of what has happened. So, they, so again, historical, looking backwards, uh, describing what has happened. Once we know this, which is called status, then we can do what's called future predictive forecast. So, you know, we get through descriptive and diagnostic, uh, again, telling us what has happened. And then we start moving into predictive, prescriptive, and semantic. So we asked before, you know, hey, how much chocolate did we sell in the Southeast during May of a certain year? Once we have the data set up properly, then what we're going to do is leverage intelligent assistance to then help us predict how we're going to do in the future. Hey, Cortana or Alexa or whatever intelligent assistant becomes the de facto platform that you're using in your business, how much chocolate can we sell in the Southeast next year based on all the data that we've accumulated from the past? So that intelligence is really what this whole course and everything that I've been doing is about, is you know what are the fundamental infrastructure pieces and how do we elicit requirements for this and, and pull all of this together to enable this intelligence to provide us with exactly that intelligence. Future forecasts, cognitive services, that really, and that's what I'm always trying to tell everybody, is that what intelligent assistance is, it's data with cognitive services. And cognitive services simply are vision, speech, language, knowledge, and search. They lay on top of data and enable humans to communicate with machines. All right. So again, let me just kind of group all these together. This data behavior links all of these different areas together. So if you've ever wondered what happens after the ERD, this is what happens. <laughs> so I'm trying to, like I said, I'm trying to fill in uh, kind of the missing piece from the traditional curriculum. Not that there's anything wrong with the traditional curriculum. It's just that we never told anybody, hey, here's what happens after you designed your ERD. Here's where it goes. And, and our job now is to make sure that it gets from the ERD all the way to intelligence. Okay, so to summarize uh, what we just covered, ETL, Extract, Transform, and Load, is the process of taking kind of the raw data in different formats, pulling it all together, uh, and transforming it, and then loading it so that it can be utilized both by humans and by machines to do both historical analysis and future predictive analytics. And the, and the way it does it, so we kind of showed you kind of from a high-level machine-oriented approach and then more from a, an actual procedural approach where we take, you know, an ERD and then we, which is transactional data, we denormalize it into a um, fact table of your star schema. Then those fact tables are dimensions 
that are then used to help us answer questions. And then those questions can be presented on a dashboard visually. And then through the, what's known as cognitive services, we can query our dashboard. And, that, and that's the idea is that in the future, really humans predominantly once operational work or when a lot of operational work is quote automated uh, then a lot of humans will be working predominantly from dashboards and using intelligent assistance to help guide the institution and in how it operates all right okay cutting out all right can you hear me now Your audio is going in and out. Sorry. All right. Joanna, ask your question. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. Okay. Apologize. Is this better? So I'm, I'm looking this way too. Joanna, you got a question? Joanna, excuse me. Okay, OLAP stands for Online Analytical Processing. Okay. Any other questions? That was it, did that all make sense? <laughs> did I make sense at all in this? ETL and data behavior. Yeah, you made a lot of sense, actually. I put together some things for me that I've heard a lot of references to, and I didn't know how they were connected. So um, thanks for that. Yeah, good. Good. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, um, next week we will be covering the uh, project estimating. And regardless of whether you're doing waterfall or agile, I'm going to be talking about just the concept of estimating and leveraging uh, data through that process and how most institutions don't really do a, a, a great job. They do some good jobs. Um, about you know how to leverage data, uh, but we're still very manual in the way we most institutions operate. And, and I guess honestly, that's a good thing if you're a human. <laughs> so, so maybe we're not as big of a hurry as we thought we would be. But if uh, and uh, and again, I'll just make a, if you're not connected with me. So first of all, there's um, a video. I'll put a video up of this recording. Uh, once it processes, I'll, I'll get it up on the back up on the meetup. If you're not a member of our meetup, please join with us. Um, if you've come in from, you know, some other part of the internet, uh, it's free. We're at www.meetup.com forward slash Tampa Bay IIBA. If you uh, would like a hard copy of this presentation as a PDF, just send me an email to rfrederick.pmp at gmail.com. Um, if you're on LinkedIn and you'd like to, you know, I would love to be a member of your network. So, um, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, I would, you know, it'd be an honor for me to become a member of your network. Also, if you are interested in training specifically or your organization is interested in specific data training uh, requirements for data or project management for data, I would love for you to let me know. I'd love to be participate in that. Um, and so uh, that would be meetings.hubspot.com or just send me an email or you can send me a text or call me, however, however you wanna reach out to me, that would be great. So, all right, with that, oh yeah, um, just a reminder, Cliff put up um, our links to uh, our groups. So again, please join our group. Uh, it's free, <laughs> it's a great price. And we do these every week. So these short uh, pieces every week and we have all of the, uh, if, you, if you want, a, a, you know, all the previous videos, again, send me an email and I'll send you back uh, all the hyperlinks to the YouTubes 
as well as the um, PDF files from all the previous sessions. So again, just send me an email, rfrederick.pmp at gmail.com. And with that, we will go ahead and close up for the day. So thank you again for your time. Have a great uh, weekend.